I'm going to talk about GraphQL. Um, in this talk, I'll start to speak about REST and the different problems that we can face with REST API. Then I introduce GraphQL. Then I talk about two great technologies that you um, come along with GraphQL called Relay and Apollo. So REST. So if we go back to 2000, uh, the web was pretty simple. Our web application was pretty simple. We had mainly just a single big web server that was rendering HTML and with data that come from a data service or something else. And there is no real interaction in our HTML page. It was mainly link or form, nothing much. But with time, uh, our HTML started to become real application with JavaScript. And our web server started to be only there to distribute data to our client application living in our web browser. And so with this new challenge that is to distribute data API came lots of different technologies, protocol, architecture. You had SOAP or RPC, XML RPC, JSON RPC, even some crazy technology like EMF uh, from Adobe. And from all these different solutions, one uh, came to become the standard. It was REST. And it has many advantages. And one of the most great things with REST was it is, it's stateless. When with REST, everything is a new array. So when you ping your server, your server gets your data, sends back your data, doesn't hold any state, and, and that fact gives us many advantages. One of the advantages is that everything is really, really easy to cache. Your HTTP cache will work perfectly with REST. And um, another advantage of REST was it's not a technology, it's not an architecture, it's just a standard. And so to distribute your data, you had a uniform interface, and it made things really easy to start with. And from all this advantage, what we gained was scalability. With REST, we are stateless, we have great cache, so we can put as many as we want of horizontal server without any effort. But back in 2010, mobile app started to become something really important. And so web server, uh, which had to distribute the API to our JavaScript client, had also to distribute data to our mobile application. And with this new constraint came some problem. So let's start to look to a very, very simple mobile, mo mobile view. It's a chat view. And if you pretty serious with REST and really want to respect REST standard, the query that you have to make to render that view are something like that. You get a list of conversation, and it will return objects that contain ID, some field, but mainly many link. And since you want to render the picture and the name of the user, you also have to, for each user that you get from this uh, data, to make a query to get the username, the picture URL, etc. And also to display the first message of the conversation, you had to make a query on the message endpoint. And if you look for a very simple view that we all have to render on our mob mobile application, you have to make something like 20 queries. And it was not so much a problem when we were on desktop application because we had great connection, um, desktop uh, laptop was very po really powerful, but with mobile, it doesn't scale well. Your application will be really slow, and on slow network, it won't work at all. So 
most of us in, uh, end up doing something like that. A special endpoint that will return all the data that our application needs. But the problem with that is it's not REST anymore at all. You lose most of the benefits of REST. Since now you're returning the data of the user directly in this endpoint, the HTTP cache won't work when we, you will fetch the user another time. And the other problem is that that's just one view. But another view of your application may consume conversation with other needs uh, for displaying other data. And so you will end up creating a lot of endpoints just to render all of your view. And there is worst. If our um, user endpoint returns suddenly uh, at the beginning of our application at only a name field. And then with evolution of the application, you return um, another field called employee cheat. This view does not need this field, but since you use the REST endpoint, you will get the data. And that makes that you, with time, the data uh, that you will send to your application will start to grow exponentially. And the worst part is when you will have some breaking change on the shape of your data. Here, we had only a name field, but now we have a first name and the last name field. On the web, that's not a problem because our web server distributes the client and distributes the data. But on mobile, you have to support your old client, all the people that don't update their application very often. And so the only way to support your old client is to have versioning. And so now you have version for the different evolution of your API. And so with all your specific endpoint and all the versions that you have to support, you start to have to maintain a lot of different endpoints. And if you just have a new version every, every year and want to support just two or three versions, just for something like conversation, you will have to maintain 10 or 20 different endpoints, which is a nightmare. But now, so REST has a lot of problems, especially with mobile application. Like we said, when we want to display complex data, we have to make multiple run trips and make a lot of different query which does not scale way um, with uh, uh, mobile. And from a maintainability um, perspective, versioning um, leads to endpoint multiplication and become a nightmare. And there is another, another problem with REST is that there is no type system. So your REST endpoints are really simple, but they don't give any information about the shape of the data that they distribute. So you can't create tools that will introspect your uh, endpoint and create documentation or generate uh, type uh, on your uh, native client. And so Facebook and Netflix that faced the exact same problem, but at a bigger, bigger scale, end up creating two technologies to resolve that problem. One of these technologies is GraphQL, that I will present a bit later, and the other is Falco. So I won't speak about Falco in this talk, but it's a great technology, and I invite you to at least look at the documentation before making a choice between the two. So GraphQL, what is GraphQL? GraphQL is a query language for API. It's a query language for API, no database. You won't be able to query a database with GraphQL, only the, endpo the endpoint API that you will define. It's strongly typed and it's 
like the name implies, it's based on graph data, so everything is hierarchical. How does it work? On your server, you will define the different type of data that your application exposes. Then you will define how the field of this different type are resolved. And on your client, you will be able to make simple query. So let's look at a very, very simple GraphQL query. It's here we are asking on the top level for a field called me. And on the object uh, um, that's returned by the field me, we're asking for the first name. And GraphQL will return JSON that have the exact same shape than what we asked. And we can really nest how we ask the different field of um, our data. Here I'm asking my first name, but the list of my post, the title of this post, the excerpt, and the categories of this post. And again, GraphQL will return a JSON response that has the exact same shape than my query. And the cool thing here is that GraphQL won't give me back fields that I don't need. I might have a last name. I didn't ask for it. It won't give me my last name. Same thing with ID, etc., etc. So GraphQL field can have some argument. Here I'm asking for the post with ID three, and GraphQL give me my post with the title and the content. You can alias your field, which is pretty cool when you have to call multiple type a field with different arguments. So here I want the post with the ID three and the post with the ID four, and I name them first post, second post, and GraphQL give me my answer. And to avoid repeating the same field again and again in complex GraphQL query, you can create fragment that will, you will use in your main query. So it's exactly the same as the query just before, but instead of repeating title and content, I create a fragment called post fragment, and I reuse this fragment in my first post query and my second post query, and I have the exact same result. Fin uh, finally, when you're querying um, data with GraphQL, you can use query with some set of variable. So here I'm creating a query called post by ID, which take a variable ID, uh, which is of type string. And when I use this um, query with uh, ID three, the server give me my post. So we only, uh, we only have seen how to query data with GraphQL, but you can also mutate your data with GraphQL, and it's pretty much the same syntax that uh, for queries, but instead of um, doing query, a query, you create a mutation, which takes a variable content, calls the field create post, and takes the ID on the post return end by this field. So, all these query I executed according to a schema that you define on your server. On all the qu uh, query that I've shown so far, the schema is pretty simple. I have a type user, which has an ID, a first name, and a type post, which has an ID, a content, and an author, which is a an user. And then, I have my two root type query, which expose a list of posts, me, which expose myself, and a type mutation, which allow me to add new post. And my schema is defined from these two root type, query and mutation. So let's look back at our example. We wanted to fetch the exact data that we needed to display this view. And with GraphQL, it's pretty simple. We need 
a list of conversation, their type, um, the other participant, their first name, their last name, their picture, and the first message. And with only one query, I will be able to get all the data that I need to render this view. And better, remember we had at the beginning only a name field and no first name, last name. And after, we wanted to introduce these two new fields, first name, last name. Or if we don't delete the file name on our server, our, our client will still work. Name could just return first name, uh, concatenate to last name, and our, our client will work. And it won't receive any more data that needed. But our new client can just query two other fields, first name, last name, and we work the same way. So with GraphQL, we don't need versioning at all. So GraphQL has a lot of advantage. You can make complex query with only one request without using any versioning. It's strongly typed, and that's great because if you make some mistake on your query, the server will tell you, okay, here you want a string, but it's not a string, so it won't work. Here you are asking for the field called me, but this type doesn't have me, so it won't work. And the other thing is that with type, you can have now introspection. You can have tools that introspect how your sch schema is constructed and generate documentation, check at build time that your query are well formed, um, and other crazy stuff. So now I will just demonstrate how to create a GraphQL endpoint. Um, I wanted to have my two hands to do so, but um, okay, so we have a very, very simple application. It contains only, um, it contains only a few dependencies. It's a very simple application that just exposes a GraphQL endpoint. We have an Express application, which listens for the URI GraphQL, and will render data described by a schema. And now I'm going to create the schema. So in, um, in our application, which is just a very, very basic blog application, we have a user type. And so to do so, I'm create a new GraphQL object type. I call it user. And then I define the field that I need uh, on this type. And so our user have field um, in a field ID, which is of type GraphQL ID. And I can give a description to that field and describe how that field resolve. So that field resolve. Ouais, en fait, le, le pied, c'est peut-être mieux. <rire> OK. So. Here, I've created my first GraphQL type. And then I can add all the um, fields that I want. So. My user of first name, which is of type and in fact when I'm just getting the same property the result function is not needed. Sorry, with one N, it's not easy. <laughs> and then it has a last name, 
and a picture Okay, sorry. Okay, so I we'll use the type as for field ID, first name, last name, picture URL. Now we're creating another type that we will call post with name post, and it will have an ID, a content, and an author which will be of type user. Okay, so I've defined the main two type of my GraphQL endpoint. Now I'm going to describe the root type, which is query. which will have post, which will be of type <coughs> Okay, and now that field post is a little bit more complex, so I will need a result function and I have a very basic database which exposes a get post which would turn a promise and so now I say to resolve the file post just get the post from the database and it's the same for the author if, if I want the author ID I want, I'm going to take okay so that's our root type query and then now I will define my schema and export it. Okay, so I have defined in my schema, which is exposed through Express GraphQL on my server. I will now launch my server. And if I go to localhost GraphQL, I have this nice little tool that is created because on my server I said that I wanted GraphQL. And now I have my GraphQL endpoint and I can make query. So I have defined a list of posts and I want the ID. And c'est bon comme ça. And their content. And now I have my post with ID and content. And if I want the author, I'm going to ask for the author. And I want 
the first name and the last name. Oh, I think I made a little mistake, sorry. In my schema, in my database, I don't have first name and last name, but just name. Uh, and now I have zero turn name. And like you said, if I try to get a field first name that does not exist, graph because GraphQL is strongly typed, the editor tell me cannot carry field first name on user. And there is cool more cooler if we go here. We can see that GraphQL generated a little documentation of our schema. And so if I go on the query type, on I, I, have, I see that there is a list of posts, and I see that the posts have an ID, and there is a description for that field, and I can go that there is a user that have a field name and picture URL, and all that is it's free. I mean, I just described my schema. I can add some little description. And if I reload the doc, that I go on the user past, I have my description. OK, now. Like you can see, there is a lot of posts, and I don't want all the content. I just want a part of the content. So I'm going to describe a new file, which is pretty easy to do, a new field, sorry. And so on my post type, I'm going to create a field excerpt. And this field does not exist on the database. I'm just going to take the post content and slice and slice it to get. And so I don't want content anymore, I want excerpt, and I have only the 100 first character. Oh, sorry. OK. And now I want to be able to choose. I want to be able to choose the length of the excerpt. So I'm going to. say that this field can have argument of type length, which is uh, of type integer. And then And so it still works because I have default value for uh, except length, but I can choose to have a length of 30. And now I have only the 34 character. And it's pretty easy to add or change field. For example, if I want, I might want to get, to get only one post. So I'm going to describe a new field called, which is of type post type, which take argument ID, which resolve okay. 
And now, I, instead of doing that, oh, a list of mistake. Wait, sorry. OK, and now I have my post, but I can get only one post with this ID. <coughs> and get the content. Uh, OK. Did I make a mistake? Okay. So that's how you define a basic GraphQL schema. Here I did it in with JavaScript, but there is an implementation of GraphQL for pretty much all the languages. There is PHP, Java, uh, and all the languages that you can find. And now get back to the presentation. So with GraphQL, there, is, um, there are many possibilities that are offered to client application. And so Facebook created a framework called Relay that's uh, which is a data fetching framework for React and taking advantage of GraphQL. And it has mainly three great features, which is it's declarative with Relay. You never do a query manually yourself. you declaring which data your application needs. Each component will declare which data it needs to be rendered. And Relay with, will more or less manage mutation for you. So the basic of Relay is you have a component which is called post item and take a post and we'll render the author name, the author picture, and uh, the excerpt of the post. And then you will create Instead of exporting directly your component, we'll use an higher order component called relay.createContainer. And you will declare the, uh, that this component needs to be rendered on an object of type post, the field author, the name, the picture URL, and the accept. And relay will automatically fetch this data for you and make sure that this component receives the post and the data that it needs. And you can compose container like you compose component with React. So we had our post item uh, component, which needs a post to be rendered. And now we have a post list, which takes a user and display all the posts of the user. So we create a component that displays a list of post item, and then, and then we declare that this component needs an object of type user, will get the field post on this user, the ID of the post. And if you look at this line, we are saying, and all the fields that the post item component needs, we, we are telling to relay to get all the fields that the post item component needs. That's a very basic use case of Relay, but sometimes you need more sophisticated logic to control all the data are fetched, and so Relay uh, support variable. So here we have the same post list, but we have a button at the end of the list 
that tell us to load more um, posts, and our post field is now page. And so we are declaring that this component as a variable called nbpm, initialize it to a value patch size, which can be 10 or 20, whatever we want. And the field post will take an argument, which is the value of this variable. And then in our component, when we want to set a new value for this variable, we will, uh, we will use the relay property that is injected in our component and say that the variable nb items is um, as a new value, which is the old value, plus um, page size. OK. Relay also have um, a set of um, utilities to manage mutation. It's a bit complex. The, the purpose is to map a GraphQL mutation to a, a relay mutation and tell relay all data are affected by um, this mutation and we can declare oh, uh, we will um, use optimistic response in our application. But like I said, I can't show you a li little example because it's a little bit more complicated. Honestly, it's the worst part of Relay. And it will be better described by an example. So we'll open. Another example, it's exactly the same, uh, it's exactly the same um, schema that we defined um, uh, before with some more field, but nothing much. And there is a basic client React application that render app and app does just an hello world. So, up. so if we start our application, now here we still have a list of posts, but this time it's called feed. And now our server is distributing a very basic React application that displays Hello World. And now we will um, create an, some, some kind of blog application, just really fastly. So one of the things with Relay is that it makes strong assumption on how your GraphQL schema is described. You can't do whatever you want with your schema. You have to use the really uh, the really way to describe schema. And basically, if we get our user type, it won't work with Relay. We have to use some Relay tool. OK. So Relay is based on the fact that you will be able to get any node uh, with a top level field on your query component. And that every, uh, that uh, you use n the node interface that basically just describing an ID on every object of your uh, schema. So instead of, um, instead of manually defining the field on the ID field on my user type, I will use the helper GraphQL relay uh, and use the global ID field function. And I will also add an interface to my user type, which is called node interface. And that's the same with post. Instead of 
using my custom post type, I will use the global ID file um, that's given by the GraphQL relay. And at the interface. Finally, on or root type, you can't really use um, array uh, um, or list as the root type of your um, schema. Relay wants you to um, have a single node as a root type of your schema. And so, my schema Now we'll only have one field at the root. So I'm going to take the, the whole schema instead of constructing it with you. So instead of um, doing it manually, I use the helpers that are given by uh, GraphQL Relay. I have a single root file on my um, on my node uh, query, and I added a mutation. Some things I showed you a little bit earlier, but um, it's a bit more complex. It's uh, a really way to describe mutation again, and um, but basically it describes how uh, this mutation are affecting my data, and so now. Um, that I this this schema. If I go on GraphQL, I have only one field at the root, which is me, and I have my feed and my feed as edge. Node. Okay, so um, all, the last thing is you can't really use directly list with relay. You have to use a special kind of list that's called connection, and connection has the advantage to be paged. So the format for connection is you have a list called edge inside the connection. Feed is a connection, and each edge has a node and a cursor. And I can ask only the three first posts of my uh, connection instead of getting all the posts. So, now to create a relay application, I will use a relay root container that's just telling relay, okay, from now you manage data. And my application will become a container. It will display a list of post items, which ask from some data on my post. And Okay, and I will get the first 100 posts and render a list of posts. So, if I go there, okay. I made the design, so. <laughs> now I have my list of posts, but it's a very, very big list. So I want to add paging. I'm going to take this application. So now I have variable and the items. This variable is injected to the first argument of the field feed. And this field and this 
at the start, this variable is five. Then I use a little component called React list, and when I um, reach the end of my list, I will update the variable and the items to get more posts. And so, now, like you can see, we have infinite list behavior. Finally, I want to be able to add some post. So here I'm introducing a mutation. I will just show you a mutation after, and um, it will be okay for this example. But basically, it allows me to create a new post, and, the, and this mutation takes a variable content and myself as variable. And so now I have a form um, with my uh, uh, with my list, and when the user try to create a new form, a new post, okay, the um, the post is added. Okay, so really mutation are a bit tricky. You have to describe exactly what the mutation need to. Um, be applied. So here, I, I absolutely need uh, my ID, my own ID. You need to describe which mutation, which GraphQL mutation will be called. Here, it's the add post mutation. You will, uh, the fat query allow you to display, to, um, to say uh, what will change uh, in your application and here, the post, that, uh, the post uh, I, I will create a post, and the feed connection will change. And all this, and the config allow you to say um, all this change uh, will be injected in my list. So basically, I'm just saying it to prepend it to the list. Finally, the list of variables that this mutation man manage. Here it's the auto ID and the content. And the optimistic response. This means that even on slow connection, I mocking all um, the data of the mutation are uh, returned. And the UI will display my new post even if it's still not effective. Really has many advantage. The main advantage for me is query collocation. Because um, if you love React like me, one of the best React feature is the fact that your component is isolated. When you have a component, it, it has a contract, which is its properties, and the other part of the, your application doesn't care about what's happening in your component. But with classic Flux or Redux architecture, that's not the case anymore, because when your component needs new data, when it changes behavior, you will have to change other parts of the, of the application accordingly. With Relay, you don't need, um, you don't, uh, need to care about anymore. If you want a new field on a component, you just add to the, you just add it to the Relay, um, to the GraphQL query, and, um, and, and so your component becomes isolated again. Everything is declarative, which is a lot more easier to manage uh, than manually calling query uh, on action of Redux uh, architecture. And that makes you really productive. Also, really has some problem. Basically, the main problem is that it makes really strong assumption on, on how your data uh, are structured on your server, which does not fit all the application. It's a bit magic. I mean, with React, I can understand perfectly what's happening in my application. With Relay, that's not the case uh, anymore. Sometimes I don't understand why it makes some queries. Sometimes I don't understand why some component will be re-rendered. It's a bit complex. Uh, the learning curve is not easy. Finally, it does not suit all the application. I mean, before choosing Relay, you can uh, use GraphQL without Relay, without any problem, but before choosing Relay, you have to think a lot if your application 
fit well in the use case. So uh, the last part of this talk will be really short. I'm going to talk about a relay competitor, which is called Apollo. Apollo is not only um, a client framework, it's a complex stack. You have an HTTP server, a client which is like Relay, some tools to, to create schema in a different way that I showed you. The client um, is, like I said, a bit like Relay, but, in, but it does not make any assumption on your schema, and you don't need any build tape, and uh, if you want to have the difference between the two, you should go look to this blog post. So, uh, like with Relay, um, you will define uh, your, um, your query alongside with your component. And like with Relay, you will have to define how your mutation affects your application. And when you want, and you can also define optimistic update it's not less complex than really, just a different um, configuration. So Apollo has many advantages. It's really flexible. You have uh, Apollo client for Angular, React, even some native client for iOS and Android. It's really simpler than really to take. Uh, um, to, uh, it's really simpler than Relay. It's a community project evoli ev evolving really fast, and it integrates well with third-party library, especially Redux. But Apollo has also some problem. Uh, container composition is not as good as with Relay. Uh, you don't have any error build time. Ma you will have to do some little thing uh, manually, more than with Relay, and since it's not made by Facebook, uh, not used in production on Facebook project, I think it's less performant. Uh, you, perhaps with some batch and back, we will see. Okay, that's all. Now, um, question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Just one word, you talk a lot uh, about React and GraphQL. Uh, what about other frameworks? So, uh, you can use GraphQL uh, independently of React, Relay, or whatever you want. And, I mean, um, since I use GraphQL, I never use REST anymore. I think it's better in every point. And if I have to make an Angular application or a number application, I will still use GraphQL. And there is some really lightweight client for GraphQL that let you just make some query. And I have entire application without Relay or Apollo or anything where I make just simple query. But the single fact that I'm able to choose which data I will get from my query is enough to be a big win in comparison to REST. Uh, and what about uh, migration from REST? to GraphQL, uh, best practices? Uh, so, um, like I never did, it. so <laughs> I don't know. I know that some people um, actually may paid a REST API to GraphQL endpoint. So their server, uh, they had a server which was just carrying some REST API and serving GraphQL endpoint. And that worked well because REST is really cacheable, so the server will have most of the REST data cached and will just send back the data that you need. Uh, that is Spark uh, with Firebase. Oh, um, Firebase is a great technology because uh, it's really simple. You can bootstrap a project in a few minutes and get your data. And, but it does not offer all the capabilities of GraphQL. With GraphQL, um, you have a lot more work to do than with Firebase. I mean, it's not a database solution. You have to create your own database, on your mutate data, on your query data, on your database. But it's a complete solution. It's just a technology to create API. Firebase is a solution, is a database, plus uh, a query language in a way, uh, and you, um, I mean, it's not exactly the same. For simple projects, Firebase can be a very good choice, but if your data model does not fit anymore in Firebase, you will have some problem. With GraphQL, you can have any kind of database behind SQL, no SQL, or whatever you want, and there won't be any problem. 
my question is, uh, you, you use the use case with uh, mobile application. Uh, what about uh, architecture like uh, microservices? Uh, is it interesting to use it with GraphQL instead of uh, REST? So, um, actually, uh, generally, you will have one GraphQL server that will ping all your microservices, and your mobile application will, um, will get data from that server. The advantage is that, um, again, you can cache the result of your different microservices, and the mobile application will just make one query to get all the data that it needs. Netflix uses um, Netflix, which uses Falco, which is not the same as GraphQL, but have many common points. Have a microservices uh, arch architecture, but they have a Falco server in front of every microservices, and um, when they make a query, it will ping the different services. Okay, so thank you very much, Francois. Thank you. For your